<laughs> They're all irrational. Thank you. Um, so I, I chose this topic because I often get asked my opinion about Aperi's theorem. And so here is here's my opinion. The first part is uh, historical. And then the second part, I'll try to put some geometry into the picture. And in the third part, I'll talk about uh, dinner parties. Um, so we begin with the anachronistically named Riemann zeta values, zeta of n, which are the sums of the reciprocals of the nth powers of the integers. And a very famous problem in the 17th century was to compute um, zeta 2. And as we all know, this was solved by Euler in the 1740s, who proved that zeta of 2 is equal to pi squared over 6. And in general, he proved that zeta of 2n is pi to the 2n times a rational number. And that rational number is given explicitly by um, a Bernoulli number. And so you can ask yourself the question, is uh, zeta of 3 a rational multiple of pi cubed, for example? And the answer is that we don't know. So we have um, a very old conjecture um, which states that the odd Riemann zeta values, zeta 3, zeta 5, zeta 7, and so on, should be algebraically independent over the field Q adjoined pi. So in other words, if there is a, a polynomial in pi and odd zeta values, which has rational coefficients, then, um, then it should be identically zero. There's no, there's no non-trivial polynomial relation between these numbers. OK, so extremely little is known about this conjecture. And I'm going to give practically the totality of known results on this one slide. The first result um, of the famous theorem due to Lindenmann in 1882, which is that the number pi is transcendental. So by Euler's theorem, we know, therefore, that the even zeta values, zeta of 2n, are all irrational numbers. Then um, a spectacular breakthrough occurred in 1979. Um, when Aperi proved that the number zeta 3 is irrational. And I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. And um, this is remarkable because um, it took several hundred, it was the first progress after several hundred years. And it's also remarkable because Aperi was 65 years old when he proved this result, his first major result. So it gives, I think it's an inspiring story. <laughs> it gives hope to us young people, perhaps hope to the older people as well. Um, and it was recognized. Yeah, but actually, he never published. There's no paper in which he proves this. It was, um, it's been published. It's very hard to trace the origin of this, this, this subject. The next big breakthrough um, was in 2000 due to Rivoal and Bohr and Rivoal. And they proved that the, um, th they proved a quantitative result. But the qualitative result is that the vector space spanned by the odd zeta values is infinite dimensional. So in particular, um, infinitely many of the odd Riemann zeta values are irrational, but we don't know which ones. And then this method was, was pushed very hard by lots of people, and the best result that can be extracted is the following theorem by Zudelin, which is that one out of the four numbers, zeta 5, zeta 7, zeta 9, and zeta 11, is irrational. But it is still not known whether zeta 5 is irrational, or perhaps more interestingly, um, if 1, zeta 2, and zeta 3 are linearly independent, and nor is it known if zeta 3 is a rational multiple of pi cubed. So we know almost nothing about this question. Okay, so how do we prove irrationality of a number? So we start with um, a real number, alpha, and we want to construct linear forms. So linear combinations of 1 and alpha where a, n, and b, n are rationals. Typically, a, n will be an integer. So to think of this, um, we'll think of this as being an approximation of alpha, uh, b, n, over a, n. So this is a, a rational number that's going to get very close to alpha. So to quantify this, um, you s assume that these linear forms go to 0 exponentially fast and are less than epsilon to the n for some epsilon. Now define um, dn to be the common denominator of these two numbers, a n and b n. So dn times a n is an integer, and dn times b n is an integer. And we assume that the um, 
we assume that the okay we assume that the denominators grow grow exponentially um, d to the n for some positive real number d. So so far this is not very hard to do to satisfy these two conditions, but the crux of the matter is that they should be related, and the denom the the d the denom the growth of denominators should not be too big. So d times epsilon is less than one. So the, in that case, then the claim is that the number alpha is irrational, and it boils down, and in fact all these proofs boil down to this fact, that there is no integer n strictly contained between 0 and 1, which I think we agree on. Um, and so the, the, the sort of motto is that we only need to construct um, linear forms, which are small, that's the first point, small than epsilon, small linear forms in 1 and alpha whose denominators are small. That's the second and third point. So here's the proof. Um, so proof by contradiction. Let's assume that alpha is a rational number. Ah. Yeah, great. So let's assume that alpha is, is p over q, where p and q are uh, integers. And then remember the, the, the first assumption. I can't get this to work. First assumption was... Um, that the linear form was small. So when we plug in alpha equals p over q, we get this equation here. That's sufficiently large n. Now multiply through this equation by q and dn, and we get uh, 0 less than dn a n p minus dn p n q. And on the right-hand side, we get q times dn epsilon to the n. And if you remember by the second assumption on the growth of denominators, the dn is at most uh, d to the n. And then by the third assumption, d times epsilon is less than 1. So this quantity here on the right goes to 0 exponentially fast. And for some sufficiently large n, um, it will be less than 1. So the upshot is that we get um, something wedged between 0 and 1. And this something um, here is dn dn a n times p minus dn b n times q. And the, the assumption on the denominator, the definition of dn was that it was the denominator of a n. So this is uh, an integer. Uh, dn b n is also an integer. So the whole thing is an integer. And we've constructed an integer between 0 and 1. So that's a contradiction. I hope that should be relatively clear. So now as a warm up, um, I want to prove the irrationality of log of 2. And for this, you take um, a rational function f of x equals x times 1 minus x over 1 plus x. And you take a differential form, uh, a differential one form, omega. And the thing to observe is that the denominator of omega is the same as the denominator uh, of the function f. So this will be the case in, in almost all the examples I'm going to look at. And now you write down a family of integrals, i n, which is the integral from 0 to 1 of this rational function raised to some to the nth power times omega. And the claim is that this gives small linear forms in 1 and log 2. So let me uh, just tell you why. So this is an exercise, but it's might as well do it. So by changing variables, this is the integral of 1 minus y 2 minus y to the m over y to the m plus 1 dy. So you'll certainly agree with me that i naught is just the integral of dy over y from 1 to 2, and that's certainly log 2. So we expect to see log 2s. And then to prove the, the claim here, you can just expand out this polynomial in the numerator, 1 minus y, 2 minus y dm and integrate it term by term. And the only remark is that integral from 1 to 2 of 2 to the m minus 1 uh, y to the, sorry, this should be n, my apologies. Uh, m, so you get a bunch of integrals like this. This integral is always an integer with a denominator m plus 1 whenever m is greater than or equal to 2. So when you expand this out, you get a sum of integrals like this, 
and each one will contribute an m plus 1 to the denominator. So you're going to get a, 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 a 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, up to 1 over n in the denominator. And the denominator will be the least common multiple of 1, 2, up to n. So that's important. That's going to come up again and again. So you always get this least common multiple of 1 up to n coming in. So now you need um, the prime number theorem. So the prime number theorem gives you an estimate for this denominator. And it's basically bounded by exponential of n. And finally, so in this irrationality criterion, we needed to, to see how fast these linear forms tend to 0. To do that, uh, it's very easy. So let me remind you that f of x equals x1 minus x over 1 plus x, considered on the unit interval. And it's bounded above by x times 1 minus x, which is going to attain its maximum at x equals 1 half. And the maximum is 1 quarter. So we get that the absolute value of this integral is less than 1 quarter to the n. So now we can apply this irrationality criterion um, to these linear forms. Epsilon, the thing that measures how fast it goes to 0, is 1 quarter. The bound on the denominators is the number e, 2.7181. And so you compute that e divided by 4 is about 0.679. And that happens to be less than 1, and you're very happy. So log 2 is irrational. And of course, the proof is not hard. It, the whole difficulty is trying to find the approximations in the first place. How do we find these integrals? OK, so now um, uh, I turn to Aperi's proof of irrationality of zeta 2. So I learned recently that this, so this proof is given by a beautiful paper by Boykers. It's very short, in 1979, I think. But I learned that Cordoba and possibly Bombieri had similar ideas. So now you look at a, an integral in two variables over the unit cube, where x and y are less than 1, of, as usual, a rational function to the n times omega, where the rational function is this thing in two variables, and, and that's omega. So now you have to work a little bit, but you can show that, there, that these integrals are linear forms in 1 and zeta of 2. Uh, a similar argument to this one shows that the denominators are bounded by dn squared. It's squared because it's a double integral now. So the constant d is going to be e squared. And the, the constant epsilon that measures how fast this goes to 0, you work out the maximum, and it's an exercise, and you get this strange quantity 5 square root of 5 minus 11 over 12. And then you hold your breath, and you compute this product, and you find that it's 0 0.6627 is less than 1, and you jump up and down. Now, zeta of 3, um, so now you look at this triple family of triple integrals. Same format as before. I won't talk you through it. Um, this time you can show, and it gets more difficult, but you can show this time that it gives linear forms in 1 and zeta of 3. And the denominator is now bounded by this least common multiple of 1 up to the n cubed, because it's a triple integral. So our, the constant d is e cubed. And this time, the, the constant epsilon, which is computed from taking the maximum of f on this cube, is now the square root of 2 minus 1 to the fourth power. And now again, you, you multiply these two numbers together, and you check that it's 0.59, which is significantly less than 1. And that proves the irrationality of z to 3. So it looks easy. Um, and many people, over many years, many decades, have tried to construct integrals that give linear combinations of 1 and zeta 5. And Can I ask you a question? Sure. So, zeta 2, zeta 2, maybe I'm not sure, but the f was like the product of the two. No. No. No, no, no. Yeah. It, it's, it's got a lot more symmetries than that. I'll come to that later. Um, so the last inequality always fails, because if it didn't, I, I'd be giving a different talk. So we know about it. So, so that we have to try a different approach. Before, I'm going to skip this. Before I do that, let me mention some, some work that's not very well known, but I think is interesting. And um, it's called the group method. <coughs> 
So now instead of having one parameter n that goes to infinity, take five parameters h, i, j, k, and l. And um, in, in 1905, a mathematician called Dixon wrote down this integral. So if you put all the parameters h, i, j, k, and l equal to n, you get exactly the Boyker's integrals for zeta 2. Okay. And actually Dixon in his paper observed that there's a, um, a symmetry of these integrals. Let me write it down. And we'll, we'll see very clearly why this is the case later on. That this family of integrals oops, <coughs> is symmetric under cyclic permutation of the indices. And later on in 1996, Rhin and Viola proved that these give, the, this more general family of integrals give linear forms in 1 and zeta 2. And they found a, um, another hypergeometric type <coughs> symmetry. Um, J factorial K factorial equals I K plus L minus I. <coughs> they found this other symmetry. And if you combine these two symmetries, they generate um, a very big group, which has of order 1440. And the idea now is that instead of letting, setting all the parameters to n and going to infinity, you let the parameters go to infinity at different speeds. So you let h equals h naught n, k equals k naught n, and so on. So where h naught... Sorry, i is this integral. Yeah, my apologies. I, I is this integral. This, this, can come, this comes from integrating Gauss's transformation for F21. And so now the idea is you're going to choose H0 and K0. So these are integers like 13, 9, 11. Choose them in some clever way and let them go to, in, to infinity. And your constant epsilon gets a lot worse. But because of this sort of identity, you can um, prove that certain prime factors don't occur in the denominators. And using this trick, they can get much, much better approximations to zeta 2 and they hold the world record for the irrationality measure of zeta 2. It took them over 10 years to find the corresponding family for zeta of 3. So again, you take the same integral Boyker's had, and you put arbitrary parameters in there, h, l, k, s, j, so on. But um, you need these tricky constraints, j plus q equals l plus s, and k plus r greater than or equal to h. Otherwise, if you don't have this, you get linear forms in 1, zeta 2, and zeta 3. And what you'll prove is that the dimension of this space is greater than or equal to 2, which is not interesting, because we already know that zeta 2 is irrational. And this is going to happen again and again. The fact that you know something prevents you from making progress. But they found these constraints to kill the zeta 2, and again, they get the world record irrationality measures for zeta zeta 3. Okay, so now I'm going to change tack and consider um, something over q to the alpha and, and alpha is about 5 or something. It's conjectured to be 2 um, and there's a whole series of, there's a huge literature people yeah um, but the approximations are much, much better than I think. So now we want to look at um, linear forms in, in several real numbers. Okay, so we have before r was 2, and now we're going to look at several real numbers, because this is what comes up more naturally, as we've seen. So suppose that we have a linear form in alpha 1 up to alpha r. And this time I want to clear that multiply through by denominators to assume that all the coefficients are integers. Okay, so now there's an integer, an integer form. And the assumption now is that the size of the coefficients grow exponentially at most e to the n. So before we just had a bound on denominators. Now, now this is a bound on numerators and denominators. It's more, a bit more tricky. And um, as before, the linear form goes to 0 like epsilon to the n. At the same sense. But there's a subtlety here that I'm not going to go into. And then the conclusion, if you apply Nestrengo's well, Nestorenko proves that if you have these conditions of very small linear forms in many numbers, 
then you can get an, uh, an effective lower bound on the dimension of the space bound by these numbers in terms of epsilon and eta. And this is great. You can even prove independence. If your linear forms are superb, you can get um, linear independence of all our numbers, if you're lucky. Of course, we can't in practice. So the idea now is um, to try to construct linear forms in many numbers. So for example, 1, z to 2, z to 3, up to z to n. And if these linear forms were excellent, then you deduce that they're independent, and you'd be on a good shape for proving this conjecture. Unfortunately, typically, the linear forms we get are very poor. And um, just uh, by way of example, let's say uh, typically we're going to get linear forms in, for instance, in z to 5, we're going to get 1, z to 2, z to 3, z to 4 and z to 5. And typically, you can show that the dimension is at most 2, at least 2, or if you're very lucky, perhaps 3. And again, this is useless because we already know that 1, z to 2, and z to 4 form a three-dimensional vector space. So what you want to do is try to kill, to f to, to kill the, the parasite with the values. <coughs> So this is what Born and Rival did in 2000. So they introduced something called very well poised hypergeometric series. And um, if you're familiar with hypergeometric series, there's always a way to write that as an integral. But those integrals are actually degenerate in, in a certain sense. Um, so it was significantly later when Stefan Fischler, building on the work of many people, including Zobin, found this integral representation for the linear forms of Born and Rival. You have to fish this out of the literature. It's of the same shape as before. It's something to the power n, so there's an n everywhere, um, times some differential form. Except there's also a little parameter r. There's a, a sort of extra tweak you can do. There's a sort of second parameter r here that you can also play with. Uh, but essentially, it's the same as the integrals we saw before. It's an integral of a hypercube of a function to the n times a differential form. But it's quite a tricky. Um, integral. Um, k plus 1 fk k plus 1 fk of that's our ak yeah well I, I, that's what I don't like um, I'm trying to put some geometry in this so um, the well poised means that the, the, the sums of each column are, are equal and very well poised is some bizarre condition that I'm going to get wrong but something like a1 equals half a0 plus a1 plus one. So you have to think of this. And there are huge formulae that don't fit on the, on the slide, so I didn't put them in. So the miracle is that these integrals give linear forms in just the odd zeta values, when a is even. And when a is odd, they give just the even zeta values. So now apply Nestorenko's criterion um, to, the first, to, to the first ones, to this uh, sequence. And it will prove exactly that. Um, the vector space spanned by these numbers has infinite dimensions. <laughs> the dimension tends to infinity as a goes to infinity. It does it very, very slowly, but it does magic. It goes to infinity. And what I think is very interesting is that you can, um, you can apply it to the second line as well. And recall by Euler's theorem that these even zetas are all powers of pi. And this will give a, a second proof of the transcendence of pi. And what's elegant about this is that these, these linear approximations are pretty rubbish. They, um, they show that the dimension is only about the logarithm of the number of terms. But even with a very bad approximation, you deduce the strongest possible result, which is transcendence. So, so if we could construct linear forms in z to 3, z to 3 squared, z to 3 cubed, then we might get the transcendence of z to 3. Um, yep. OK, so this is my cop-out slide. Um, I'm not going to say much about this. The, the linear forms occurring in Aperi's proof are of this form, a n z to 3 plus b to b n. Actually, there may be a 2. I, I may have forgotten. It may be twice a n z to 3. I apologize. And this is a very famous sequence of integers, 1, 5, 73, 14, 45, and so on. And they are solutions to a recurrence relation. Um, that's kind of clear. When you have any family of integrals of this type, you have a Picard-Fuchs equation you're going to get recurrence relations. Um, 
but this family has been discovered and rediscovered many times uh, in the literature. It's related to modular forms, to mirror symmetry, to all sorts of interesting geometry. It's worked on by people in the audience, including Matt and many others. I'm afraid that the history lesson has to end here, but this has spawned a vast amount of literature uh, that grows out of this subject, and um, I'm afraid I have to stop at this point. And